Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only help shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. On February 23, 1945, photographer Joe Rosenthal snapped what is the best known picture of World War II. Atop Mount Suribachi on the Japanese held island of Iwo Jima, he photographed six U.S. Marines in placing an American flag on the mount, signifying that the volcanic mountain was in American hands. At the base of this 556-foot volcanic heap, U.S. Marines, fighting a desperate battle to wrest the island from the Japanese, shouted with joy and fired their weapons in the air when seeing an old glory. Ships offshore supporting the land battle let loose with whistles and horn blasts. A low in the fighting ensued. But after several minutes of rejoicing, the battle resumed in all its fury. Witnessing this event was a young African-American Marine, Gil Brooks. Seeing Old Glory flying over Mount Suribachi meant more to Brooks than to most others, as he was one of the few African-Americans accepted by the Marine Corps to join its ranks. His acceptance was a solid step taken toward the integration of the heretofore segregated Corps. Gil Brooks' attainments and those of others like him within the Marines were flag raisers in themselves. They resulted in the eventual integration of all the U.S. services after the war. Brooks therefore had more reasons than others to rejoice on seeing all glory raised on Mount Suribachi that day. Gil, you were born into a military family and raised at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. What was life like for you as a young African-American? It was during the Depression. Uh, when I would talk to youngsters that lived outside of the fort and also at the high school where I attended, uh, I realized that we were quite fortunate to be Army brats at that time because uh, some of the facilities that we had access to and the, uh, the military that uh, we had access to, the people that we knew in the military and uh, our parents being all military, we, we just, at that time, I didn't realize how fortunate we were. And I've come to appreciate it all the more as I get older. And uh, in a way, I, I sort of hated to see the old, old type army go out, you know, having been brought up there, you know, having even served overnight in the old guardhouse in Fort Huachuca when we were kids, we got picked up. Uh, and then the way it expanded, I just felt, well, you know, the army is getting so big, so uh, impersonal, you know, and just uh, as a result of my being close to the military, having done KP in the, in the uh, mess halls for the soldiers and having delivered papers to the soldiers, and the troops in the uh, the old 24th Infantry Regiment. I just, uh, I didn't like what I saw. And then when I left, going to, I went out to Los Angeles to go to college. Um, and even when I go back home to visit, I just felt that, well, this is not the same old military. So at the time, I think I was in my second year at LA City College, uh, the, uh, they announced that the Marine Corps were going to except blacks, you know, and uh, so I toyed around with the idea for a while and uh, I said, well, I think I'm going to try the Marine Corps, you know. I, I, I've always admired, you know, the old Marine Corps tradition and everything, although I knew it was segregated and that it would still be segregated because the Army was segregated at the time. Well, I, I went down and volunteered. And they had a, uh, of course, a segregated uh, base at uh, Camp Lejeune called Montford Point. 
And that's where they trained the first black Marines, you know. Do you think the training that you received at boot camp was good preparation for what you're about to experience when you were shipped to the Pacific Theater of Operations? Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, not only then, but to today, the self-discipline that I was taught and developed in the Marine Corps has been a lasting effect on myself as an individual most of my life. I could say all of my life. So, uh, yes, I was I was a little wild when I first went in the Marine Corps, you know, and uh, being an Army brat and being in the hills of Arizona and Tombstone and so forth. I just, uh, I needed something to settle me down, and the Marine Corps, they did it very quickly. February 19th, 1945, your unit, the 8th Marine Ammunition Company, took part in the invasion of Iwo Jima. Right. The first island considered part of the Japanese home islands. Gil, what was invasion day like? Well, at that time we had, uh, they were all white officers. And uh, even the NCOs were white because none of the blacks had been in the service long enough to obtain any rank. But as a company clerk, I always said the the elite group of our outfit of the blacks was the, the mess sergeant, the supply sergeant, and I think it's typical in any outfit, you know. Um, and of course, the company clerk, you know. I, so I really felt right at home with, with the group. And we shipped out of uh, Honolulu, and we were on an LST. One day we, we uh, just come upon this, uh, now we heard the, the shelling and we saw flats, flares and bombs and so forth. Uh, and uh, we realized that we were this island. We had no idea where it was. And of course, you know, we were all talking to each other and trying to find out where are we and so forth. Well, anyway, it wasn't until about that afternoon that uh, the unit commander called us all together and gave us a briefing. And we knew that we were off the coast of Iwo Jima. And at that time, uh, you know, from what we could hear and see, uh, as a matter of fact, one time we thought we actually saw one of those kamikazes dive into one of our uh, US, one of the US ships. And so now we're saying, well, gee, I'm sure they won't put a plane into this little LST. They'll, they'll shoot for the larger aircraft, the larger uh, battleships out there. But uh, um, we began to get very apprehensive and nervous, of course. And this was on the 22nd or 23rd, two or three days. Because when we went in, they took our LST right up into the um, beach. And we were able to unload the two pontoons. They pulled the pontoons off and they laid them on the beachhead. And most of our gear and everything, we were able to walk on those pontoons right up to our site, uh, which was, I guess, from 50 to 100 yards from the base of Mount Sarabachi. And Gil, we, can you describe for our audience what Iwo Jima, the island, looked like? It looks like black ash. <laughs> that's, that's what I, I remember all over, black ash, it's volcanic ash. It was like sand, and you, when you walked in it, you knew you one step, uh, two step forwards, one step back, because you'd sink in this ash. And I can see now why they had the, the uh, pontoons, because the vehicles were having a time getting off the, on the um, inshore. Uh, after all the sitting out there and hearing and feeling and seeing all this action, we felt that, you know, it was going to be worse than what it really was. But uh, we sort of gained, uh, at least I did, sort of confidence and say, hey, uh, you know, this isn't going to be as bad as we thought it was, you know. And so we proceeded to head on to our site. And myself as a platoon leader, uh, I had asked the, uh, some of the fellows, you know, if we could uh, 
uh, most certain things that we had to do, and I had talked to them and explained to them what they were supposed to do once we hit the site. There were a few sniper bullets, but not really, nothing at all what I you know, thought it would be. And uh, so we laid out, laid out the sights, and then we went back, and we dealt with the platoon. There was another platoon that was supposed to do the unloading, to load the trucks, and, and we were supposed to ensure that the trucks, when they came in, uh, different types of ammunition would be loaded, uh, put on the sites that we had marked out. And of course, some of the other guys, you know, they knew exactly what they were supposed to do. Everything was just really laid out. Uh, and uh, everything was just going great. Even though it was a segregated unit, there was that comrade uh, or togetherness that you wouldn't expect to, to feel or unless you had been together. As I said, like a family. Basically, that's the way it was. Could you explain to our audience what Mount Suribachi is? As I said, you know, it was volcanic ash all over. But remember, uh, Suribachi was, had, had been, I guess still is, a volcano, you know, uh, with crevices from where the volcanic ash had come down and made deep crevices in the mountain. There were a few scattered trees, and that you didn't see many trees on the island. But for some reason or another, Suribachi had a few trees scattered about. And, uh, but you know, we just, and it, it was the only mountain on, on the Iwo Jima. It was at the southern tip right where we were. Everything out going north was uh, just plain, um, uh, not like a desert, but uh, uh, there was not, uh, not many, not much greenery. Uh, we didn't see any sign of any people having lived there uh, uh, and the population or anything. So uh, later on, I read and I found out that the Japanese had vacated the island. They had taken it over and had did their modifications of the islands to their specifications. So uh, it uh, was just, as a matter of fact, you felt sort of secure because you got this big mountain here behind you, you know, all the fighting's up forward, you know. We're saying, hey, you know, this. So we went about doing our job, doing what we were supposed to do. Where were you when that famous flag raising took place on Mount Suribachi? You know, it's the funny, some things in your life you remember the least little detail, but uh, I had just proceeded to tell some of the guys, we had some ammunition that was supposed to be shipped up forward. And for some reason, it, it ended up in the dump, you know. And we were in the process of getting trucks back to reload this ammunition to move it on up, on up forward. And all of a sudden, you know, things just got real quiet. You know, we didn't even hear the truck engine going. And the truck, we were signaling the truck, and I happened to look up. And that's when I saw a bunch of guys up there. Now, this is at the top of Sarabachi. And, uh, you know, it was just odd, you know what I'm saying? I wonder what they're doing up there, you know? I'm thinking the mountain's secured, you know? So I'm wondering, what are they doing up there? And then as this was going through my mind, all of a sudden I saw the flag unfurl. And really, to this day, it was, it was a, quite a sight to see Old Glory, you know, on top of Sarabachi, you know. And, uh, it, and then, I guess, the whole island saw it, you know, because everybody had seen it, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, the guns were fired and everything, but, you know, Everybody was just joyous. The uh, ships out in the harbor was honking their horns and things, you know, and I said, well, uh, I'm thinking this must be the end, you know, the island must be secure, you know, and so, you know, then I, I remembered what we were there for. 
And, you know, in my own mind, I'm saying, well, I hope they don't really need this ammunition, but we better get it out of here. So I told the guys, you know, to get the truck in there and get it loaded. And then I guess it just seemed like just all of a sudden all hell broke loose, you know, and um, just bullets and um, mortar shells and everything just. And then I realized, hey, this dump. You know, they're trying to zero in on us, you know, so, you know, we had been trained, we had been told that, uh, well, anywhere you set up an ammunition dump, you have to worry about the security and safety of it. And uh, so our first idea was to get everybody out of there. And I turned, we had a couple of tanks that had been there. They had come to pick up their load of ammunition, you know, because we had supplied some of the tanks directly from the ship. The tank had pulled up and it just turned around when the mortar shell hit or something. And I'm trying to make it to that tank. And all of a sudden I thought, you know, somebody had stuck a poker in me or something, you know, and I looked down and uh, I said, gee, you know, and next thing I knew, and to this day I don't, I don't really remember what happened. I was told that the tankers had pulled me under the tank. And when the shelling was over, I got evacuated. And uh, well, as the article, when I woke up, I was on the hospital ship. And what amazed me, the first thing, to be in some white, clean sheets. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was back in heaven, <laughs> so, you know. Three or four days later, just I began to come around. Uh, they came in and, and asked some of the guys to, to go back uh, on the island, you know. And so I'm figuring, well, hey, you know, I'm, I'm in good shape now. You know, I just got it patched up and everything. And I really missed all my buddies. And I was just, you know, curiosity. I wanted to know what had happened and everything. And the island still wasn't secure, you know, because you could still hear the uh, shelling and everything out there. And I understand that's when the fighting really got terrific out there, you know. So. Gil, for I, that I action, you I were awarded the Purple Heart? I got the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. And the Bronze Star. Right. I never, I didn't see my unit again until I was in the hospital at Pearl Harbor. So and you did uh, not go back to your unit? I didn't go back. Um, I was sent to uh, join my unit. They were back on Maui, and they were back to train to go to Okinawa. So when I rejoined the unit, you know, um, there were several guys that, you know, hadn't made it. Uh, I found out, you know, my uh, platoon leader didn't make it. Uh, but everything, you know, got back in the swing of things, and. Uh, we were stationed at Hilo, and um, one day they had a parade, and uh, we were honored with uh, Purple Heart, Bronze Star, and all this sort of thing, you know, and then we got ready to go, figured we were going to Okinawa, and we had been told that, you know, this was, Okinawa was supposed to be the end of the Pacific Campaign. Well, you know how you hear stuff like that, you know, <laughs> you see, well, anyway, I guess about three months later, in the meantime, I had pl applied for V-12, Navy V-12 program. And uh, Now, what is the Navy V-12 program? That was like, it wasn't, it was a prep course prior to going to OCS. Uh, once you finish the V-12 program, um, you were commissioned in the Marine Corps. And uh, at that time, as far as I knew, there weren't any black officers in the Marine Corps, you know. And by, the, by that time, you know, I had made, I was a buck sergeant. And you know, buck sergeant in the Marine Corps <laughs> was great at that time, you know. And uh, so anyway, we got the orders uh, that I was to be I had been selected to go to V-12, Parker Purdue University. And uh, that's where I left the unit. Uh. Gil, when you came out, and after fighting for your country during World War II, 
What was it like coming home to a society that still practiced segregation? As far as uh, race, uh, I never, it was there, you know, but uh, after a while, you know, you, you sort of accept, you don't accept it, but you uh, tend to, to move on, hoping things are gonna get better. And things were getting better, you know, especially in the military. Uh, you know, by that time, Truman had uh, integrated the armed forces, and uh, I saw a, a, an opportunity for a good career in the military. And uh, I'm glad I made that choice to this day. As it is today, today, would you fight on behalf of America as you did in 1945? Oh, definitely. Oh, sure. You know. Uh, why not? I don't have any reason not to. You know. Well, in closing, do you have anything to say to the youth growing up today? The self-discipline that the military instills in you. Uh, you learn how to assume responsibility, not only for somebody else, but for yourself. And then, as for yourself, then you have a concern for the next guy or the next person, you know. And uh, I'm not saying that everybody that comes out of the military is perfect, but I think they do set a good example. Do you see elements of the current generation in the past generation? Can you compare the current generation to your generation and make any comment? As the old saying, each generation is weaker and wiser. And I believe that, that, that illustrates the, past, the generations. I notice the youngsters now, you know, they're more youngsters attending high school, completing high school, going on to college. Uh, I remember when I was in the service, there were people that couldn't read and write, you know. But they had a lot of intelligence, but they had no way of expressing it. They didn't know how. But now there's a lot of opportunities for people like that. And I think that's what makes the current generation uh, much smarter or more intelligent because they realize, as the Urban League, to say, Urban League says, the human mind is a horrible thing to waste. And so those little sayings like that, I, and you know, the military is good for that. They drill this stuff into you, you know, and uh, I, as I said, in the Marine Corps, I came out of boot camp. I thought I was the greatest fighting machine on <laughs> until two sailors convinced me otherwise right out in San Diego. So, you know, uh, uh, it takes more than brawn. It takes a little brain, too.